Now, with that, we're going to do, uh, we're going to have one talk and then we're going to have some panel discussion. The talk that we're going to have is from Hubert. What's your last name, Hubert? What he said, Hubert Tayeb. Um, uh, Hubert has been uh, with ORS for a short time. Uh, he comes from having done his PhD in biomedical engineering, where he did some imaging and some computational science research. And he's the beneficiary of one of uh, Canada's really forward-thinking funding programs in Quebec. They have uh, done maybe maybe the, this is for all provinces. They've done some really My nice yes, it's for all for all provinces. They've done some really nice funding where you can get uh, industry academia collaboration. And so through the partnership of ORS and the Reznikov lab over at McGill. Uh, Hubert gets, uh, gets mentored and uh, gets uh, experience in both the industry software and the bone biomedical science uh, that he gets uh, the benefit of working with Natalie. And so Hubert has been uh, with us and he's going to tell us a little bit about some of the things he's done and of course the, the research that he's doing with us and the research with Natalie are all tightly coupled and, and coordinated. And so um, I'm going to turn it over to Hubert who's going to give us a talk on pre-trained models unleashed a case study with bone micro CT data. And uh, I think we're broadcasting. I'll let you start your, uh, your timer queue and uh, I'll, I'll give it away. Thank you. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. So yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Vataya, so I'm a postdoc uh, in Natalie's lab and also at ORS. So I have this uh, boss, um, boss hat. Uh, so to say, and um, today we're going to talk about like a really specific case scenario of using pre-trained model. So just a hands up, who ever heard about pre-trained model, except from yesterday that we had the, the talk. Okay, so yeah, just a just few of you know what it is. So that's exactly the, the, the role of this talk, and we will see that with an example of, of what it is and how it can help uh, in the research. So, but before that, I wanted to just talk about how did I, how did I discover Dragonfly. So during my PhD, I was doing a lot of single cell imaging, and uh, it was like a confocal microscopy. There was like a lot of complexity because I had uh, 3D imaging, time lapse, three channels that was for the nucleus that you can see, M cherry and M venus, and uh, it was single cell uh, imaging. So you can see here a movie when you have single cells in a microfluidic chip live dividing uh, over a, a course of 30 hour, and then. I was doing this single cell tracking over time. And the reason I'm saying that is that so you understand what I come from, from the imaging um, perspective. Uh, so yeah, the colors are coded from a um, cell cycle indicator, but that's okay, it's not that's relevant for, for here. Uh, and actually we published that and we got a cover in the lab on the chip. Uh, so this is what I like to call my brochettes. So we got like all of the cells uh, aligned and they have this nice colorful uh, uh, looking uh, images. They are single cell tracking in, in uh, 3D with all of the different um, nucleus colored. Uh, but also, during the, my PhD, I also developed a, a software, a tool for people to do single cell tracking using this uh, platform, those, those, this Fuji cell cycle indicator. And hence, this is the reason why I kind of came here in, in this position of being half with the imaging, with the research with Natalie, and also uh, in, in Dragonfly. But okay, let's, let's dive into uh, the actual topic. So, Pre-trained uh, model use some things called transfer learning. Is when you take a knowledge of uh, something and you just apply it to something else. A really good example will be, uh, you know, this this monkey just showing uh, someone how to use a tool to open a net. You know, they are smart. <laughs> they know already how to do that. You know. So the thinking, you know, the thinking is there is already knowledge about a specific task, and you can transfer that knowledge uh, to someone else. Okay. So the actual pre-trained model, uh, as we'll talk about it, was released in the 2022.2 for the first time. And they exist as as model of different architecture. And it's not a semantic segmentation um, in the beginning, right? So you have these models that are, so to say, virgin. So people can just use them like this. And they can just train them on their particular task of semantic segmentation. Usually, they have advantages, such as improving the performance of the model having a, a faster convergence and re reducing the training time that, that you need to, uh, to do that. But um, don't trust my words and I'm going to show you and I'm trying to convince you that this is working with a case uh, scenario. So just to have the experiments um, to show you what I did. So the goal was to e evaluate the benefit of a pre-trained model available, so a unit versus two. Um, so the untrained model, like the classic unit that you will be using against two pre-trained models. 
one which is called ORS 500K, which is a model that's been trained on many different scientific uh, data, which is micro CT, electron microscopy, a different range of scientific data. And then bone 500K that we called, which is a pre-trained model only trained with grayscale bone images. Again, no segmentation at this point, just bones data. And the idea is to see if it performs better. So uh, the data set that I will be using in the, uh, to, to show you this is three data sets. So we got a chimpanzee and two human uh, bone sample. Uh, so the tibia, we got femur proximal, femur distal. Uh, actually, we have more data sets than this, but for the sake of uh, simplification, I'll just show you these three data sets and how they perform uh, individually. So what I uh, did was, this is one training set, for example. So just a few slices, like it's like 10 slices. Right, uh, of, the, of the bone of this example. Then we get the bone uh, segmentation that was given to me. And from this bone segmentation, we took some patches, like this training mask that you can see in red. Okay, and we did the training with either one tile, four tile, or 16 tile. And then we use uh, just an empty uh, slice to do a test, to see if the model uh, perform uh, properly on the test uh, entire slice. And here is some of the results. So when I say improved performance, what do I mean? So what you see here is the DICE score on uh, Entrain versus ORS 500 versus Bone uh, 500K. And we can see that this is after the training, okay, 250 epoch, uh, several replicates of the same model. And maybe Benjamin will talk about this a bit later. But the idea of being replicate is something that maybe people don't usually do is that Sometimes if you just train the same model at fixed parameters, you can get a, a variation of results at the end of your model. Just because the initial, uh, and, um, the initial seed seeding of the weight of the model is something which is uh, randomized. So you can have a variation uh, of the result at the end, but not necessarily because the data is bad, just because you really have this uh, distribution of um, training. Uh, so we can see that the pre-trained model always performs better and by a quite high margin with respect to the untrained model. And again, if you remember, the S1 will mean few data and S16 will, be, will mean like a bigger training data set. And then we have the uh, bone uh, 500K, which is not always more uh, uh, like performing better in the DICE score but uh, is doing it for the high, uh, like the more training data set you have, it performs better for this uh, sample. Now we can, I'm just gonna show you uh, the other data set that I, that I said, so the human from your proximal. And again, uh, same uh, uh, thing we can see, the pre-train always perform better. And the bone 100 is better for, you know, middle size training data set or high training size data sets. And then another example, then in this case, uh, we have the, oh, is it time the same? Oh, no, sorry, so in this case, it was actually better across all uh, different training uh, data sets size, and then only for the two different data sets. The point is, it depends a lot on, on your data sets, right, so on the training, on the images that you are putting in your training, but systematically, we got to improve performance when you use a pre-trained model with no cost to the users. So you don't have to do anything. You just get those models that are already loaded into Dragonfly in a new release, and you can just train them, and you will get, at least as far as uh, Benjamin tested and I tested, better results than normal units, classic. Uh, another thing that I said is you can get like a faster convergence. So let's look at the validation uh, dice on uh, the different uh, models. So we got the different uh, experiment, right? So one. Oh, Hubert, let, me, let me interrupt. All of the users are used to looking at the, the dice uh, as a. Uh, the loss. Call. No, that would be the loss. So the, the dice okay, is I'm the. used to looking at the loss function, so just calibrate everyone that higher is better. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. So yeah, the dice will be the. So the one will mean that two images are exactly the same. Yeah? So it's kind of like the same thing that we, had, we heard yesterday, the union of the, I don't know what's the other term for it. So it's a measure of similarity. So yeah, the higher, uh, the better. So when you train, you want this to reach one. And when we use a pre-trained uh, model, ORS 500, we can see the drastic increase in performance uh, for the training. Uh, and this is really significant even from the beginning of the, the training, when you have like really uh, small epoch numbers. Then when you use the bone 500, we also see a 
bitter, like a, a small increase, but the big work was done with the pre-trained model in general. But still, we do have uh, always, when we look at the end, um, the bond uh, which is a little bit higher than the general pre-trained model. And it makes kind of sense because we are now doing segmentation on bonds and the model was trained on a just big data sets of bond images. Um, yeah, and something which is also interesting is that, you know, you can, like, no matter how, how much you, you will train, you see like the, the untrained, it does catch up somehow, but it never reach the same accuracy that you will get with a pre-trained, or maybe you will at, I don't know, Epoch 2000 or something, which is really something that I think is powerful and could be really uh, useful for the community to, to, to try. Uh, so yeah, then maybe uh, you want to talk about the calibration? So you said uh, that. I haven't actually seen this movie. Why don't you okay. talk about it and then okay. So one thing which is important um, uh, for, uh, for this work is that we use pre-trained models, so I use different data sets, and I want the intensity to be the same, so there is the tool in, in Dragonfly, which is the calibrate, calibrate Intensity Scale. I'm just gonna show you where it's located. And this becomes important when you have data sets of uh, multiple uh, origin. So we heard yesterday the talk about the cortical, and uh, oh, let me just pause that here. Yeah, oops. Can I pause it here? I have to come here. Okay. So we heard yesterday the talk about the cortical and trabecular, and, and in this case, they had to normalize the data because sometimes from one scan to the other, you will not have the same distribution of the histogram. So the calibration intensity uh, scale manager allows you to train your, your deep learning model without doing this normalization on your data sets, which will be changing the images. In this case, you will just say what's the background, what's the bone. Actually, the software does a pretty good to automatically find you the two uh, main region. And then, you have some, when you have your data which is calibrated, so you didn't change your actual data, you just change uh, those two values that will be used in the deep learning model uh, to, to train across different data sets. And it's worked pretty uh, well. I mean, you, we also heard about this a little bit before. So it's really a, a really good tool when you have different data sets uh, from different origin. And so what, <coughs> yeah. what, I'll, what I'll add to that is the, uh, yeah, so what I'll add to that is the, um, I, I think you better explain, you know, you often have data sets that sometimes the histogram is brighter on one sample than on the other, and this is to, to deal with that. Um, and the, the model we've adopted or the pattern we've adopted is uh, you can either use a universal scale that we suggest or you can define your own scale. And by scale, I mean as an example, when Mr. Celsius decided uh, that temperature could be on an arbitrary scale. He said, let's call the boiling point 100 units and the freezing point zero units. It's just an arbitrary decision. Um, but, and that's his centigrade scale. And since the word centigrade is already taken, I didn't use that. But we're also using a centigrade scale. And you might say uh, the bone density, the, the mode, or the, um, you might say mean, but I would say the mode density in our, in our bone will be 100 centigrade units, and the mode intensity of our air will be zero units. And then when you calibrate, instead of, if you look at the histogram afterwards, instead of seeing that a histogram, I've got a histogram of 10,000 counts for air and 35,000 counts for bone, you'll see I have a, a, a peak of zero for air and a peak of 100.0 units for bone. So your data is still there. You can, just like you can convert back to Fahrenheit or to Kelvin, you could uh, undo the calibration and convert back. You don't lose any precision. Um, but this means that the next scan, which instead of 15,000 and 35,000, maybe it's at 8,000 and 49,000, Again, you put it at 0.0, .0 centigrade units and 100.0 centigrade units. And so you can use my scale, which is based on two. They're, they're all basically based on two endpoints. You can use my centigrade scale, or you can make up your own scale. But you make it up, you apply it to the data, and then you train. And then if you ever go to use that model on another data set, Dragonfly will tell you, hey, this data set you're using, uh, sorry, this deep learning model you're using, it was built on data trained on the centigrade scale. Your data is not calibrated to the centigrade scale. Do you want to continue or do you want to go and do a quick calibration first? So the, the deep learning model keeps track of what unit system you're working on and you can, you can share those units with other people. Uh, and uh, that's going to be important 
it's relevant for Hubert's talk. It's relevant for what we're going to talk about in the panel discussion. And I don't think we've done a good job of making sure everyone understands the benefits of calibration. But now, once you've calibrated data, anytime you're in the software and you, you say, how many counts is this, whether it's by a point probe or a line probe or a histogram, it'll say it's 0.0, .0 centigrade units or 0.0, .0 marsh units or whatever scale you have. It's no longer, that's 8,000 counts and 49,000 counts. Um, I guess we don't, I don't want to disrupt you anymore with questions. He agreed to let me come up here and, and interrupt him like this. It wasn't, it wasn't a total jerk move. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I wanted to get that picture out there so people know what we mean because it's, it's, it's a, an important part of our best practices discussion coming up. Thank you, Hubert. Yeah, no worries. And uh, I'll show you in a second why it's so important for my case. But uh, before, I just want to show you how to find those pre-trained model, right? So you just... Um, you go to the, the deep learning uh, tool, uh, and then you just create a new model, and you have to go to pre-train by Dragonfly team, and then inside of value, now you get your uh, range of different uh, model. Wait, let me yep, come back just here. Yeah, so as you can see, there is a bunch of pre-trained model that are ready to be trained on. Uh, so there is unit with different uh, depth, there is uh, sensor 3D, so it's not only units, it's really something that you can explore uh, on your own to see uh, what would be fitting for you. Okay. And then you... Just yeah. to mention, the same uh, functionality is accessible, of course, from the uh, same with Yes, yeah. But really, really look for the pre-train by the Dragonfly team. What? Can you say that into your microphone? Oh yeah, so you can also find the same uh, uh, model in the segmentation with us. So just go with pre-train by the Dragonfly team. Okay, so then just to understand like why it's so important for me, like this calibration, uh, the post that my post project is actually about creating a universal soldier that will be able to segment in an unsupervised way uh, bone samples. The idea is, it's been like years that since people have been segmenting bones data sets and it will be so beneficial to have one model that will work across different uh, animals, uh, across different voxel, voxel size, to be able to let the user focus on the science and not uh, on the segmentation task of the bone, which sometimes can be complicated. So for that, we got a library of different uh, scan from different animal at a different uh, resolution. And uh, at the moment, we have like three kind of main data sets, uh, so to say. So there's like a repository that was created before I arrived. Then there is a body farm animal, which is human, uh, femur. Then there is a pathology collection of bones. And then there is the Mud Abbott uh, Museum. And the, 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 the important part is that we get scans that, that range across a, a big voxel size uh, um, scale, which is really important because the idea is really in the future, you'll just use that in Dragonfly, just plug it in your data, and you will just directly uh, your results. And then you understand why the calibration is so important for me, because I want that to be scalable across any uh, data set that contains bone, basically. I'll just show like, quickly one more slide, like just, just a quick, of, of, uh, quick like, pre uh, preview on what I've been working on. So I started in January, and now I'm going to show you like just the training, uh, uh, how it looks, and the test on six different data sets. So you know. Taking all of them together, they have different resolution and see uh, how they perform again when we look at the um, untrained ORS or bone uh, uh, model. And we can see that uh, in this case, le, the bone is still a bit higher than the, the other two. But this is critically different from the previous plots because now it's not only one data set on one. We got six uh, different scans coming from different animals, coming from different origin bring into one training set. And then we can do uh, the same as before, a test to see on, on the different slice. And we can see that the bone still performs better uh, than, than the other, um, So, which is a good indication. It's like the calibration, making this calibration, putting all this data together and training that across a different sample that the model never saw still yields uh, good results. So in conclusion, uh, the pre-trained model always outperform the untrained model as far as uh, we tested it. There is other uh, um, spe specific trained model that you know, could be possibly created in the future, because now it's only bone micro CT. Maybe FIPSEM micro CT specific data could be created. I don't know. There is other model architecture that uh, the units, as I said, in the sensor 3D. So there's many. Just, just go for it and just uh, work with the one that, that works good for you. And I hope that I convinced you about the advantage of this 
at zero extra cost for you as users. And I think the main message is just go, go for it, go try it, see what it works or not, and we'll be happy to get feedbacks uh, for, for this. And uh, ultimately, like the last part is the pre-trained model that are like virgin to be tested on. Uh, we also uh, were talking about this and it will be, uh, I think, beneficial that now that you have your pre-trained model that you train on your data sets, which will be calibrated, that it could be possible to make that available to the whole Dragonfly user base. Because but I think maybe we'll talk about this a bit later. Because in the end, we are working on the same uh, specific specimen sometimes. And you know, why duplicate models when you could just bring that together into one uh, platform, which Dragonfly is really perfect for. Uh, and just a quick conclusion on the, on the universal uh, soldiers. So most likely, we'll take the bond at the first primer for the model. And more training set will always be better, right? More clean, nice training set will always be better to build this tool. So if you want to participate to bring data set with segmentation, uh, just, just contact me. Uh, you get the emails here. And I will be happy to, to include that and to maybe try to build something which will be uh, really as universal as possible. And yeah, I'll just like to thank uh, the Nicola and, and uh, Natalie. It's amazing to be in this position where I get access to so many brain resources, technical resources. So we have like a huge uh, farm computers in the lab. We have like five computers with 512 gigabytes of RAM, amazing graphics cards. So it's really good to be at this intersection between two amazing people and the team of ORS and be able to try to move forward to create something that hopefully would be beneficial for uh, a lot of people. And then if you have a question, please. <laughs> talk too much. No, that was fantastic. That was really great work. I think, uh, I think you got a lot of people excited here. Um, and uh, let's just uh, let uh, Matthew know that we know uh, he has a PhD. So we'll put Doctor Sorry. in front of Matthew Oopsie. next time, too. <laughs> no, no, this is fine. Um, we, have a, we have a lot of uh, highly trained people on our team. Um, uh, fantastic work. I think, uh, I think there might be some questions before we hand it off to the panel discussion. Does anyone want to ask Hubert some questions? Uh, we'll start right here with Doug. Yeah. So the question is, uh, the S1, like the difference between the bones and the or, uh, ORS 500, it's really small. And in S1 and S16, when you have more data sets, the difference is more visible. I don't know why that will be the case. So when we come to like really small uh, tiles like this, so that would be like a 200 by 256 by 256 uh, tile. That's really a small amount of data. Why would that yield this uh, curve in this specific sample? I cannot, I cannot uh, explain it. But if you will get another sample, you may not find uh, that, um, that close uh, relation between the two. So in general, the, the pre-trained model, you know, like, the, um, like really the main thing to, to realize is it's just an, a massive improvement. And now the difference between the ORS and the bone, it's something which is really preliminary. I studied really recently, and I'll have to, to go and to do more analysis to understand how we can benefit from this difference, but regardless, the advantage is just massive. But yeah, I cannot explain like exactly what. The, before you get to your second question, if you remember it, the, uh, uh, the blue band here is the 95% confidence interval uh, computed from the, the nine replicates. And we can see in the data set where you used, I've never seen these data before today, so I'm just eyeballing it with you. Um, we can see from uh, the S4 data set that had four times as much training data, there was much higher variance among the nine replicates. And so uh, it, it might merit a, a deeper dive into see uh, what's responsible for that spread. Um, we, do, we don't talk much, and we can talk about it during the panel, we don't talk much about the variance in doing the exact same deep learning training experiment. And uh, uh, it is true that you could train a data set on, on a model and then repeat the exact same experiment and get a lower performance model or a higher performance model. So there is variance. Turns out that variance goes down dramatically when you add more data, which I know is exactly the opposite of what we're seeing here. Um, but I've got 
more data I could show you to show you that the variance falls uh, in as you add data. So it might be might be something to explore and see what's going on statistically, and maybe there's some that, uh, some outliers that are depre that are causing a widespread and depressing and causing an increased gap. Uh, but you know, the, but we do see the gap at S16 is bigger than S1, and uh, it could be that uh, you have a, a higher ceiling. You definitely have a higher ceiling for performance when you have more data, and it could be that uh, the pre-trained models uh, uh, close that gap better when you have more capacity to learn. But we're just uh, it's, it's early days. We're just speculating, yeah, right? Just and I think these guys yeah. want to talk too. I mean, I mean, just add that we don't use that augmentation on these slides. So just to, to see the difference between the two, if we use that augmentation, the difference would be. Uh, yeah, so I actually have curves. I didn't put it here because I just want to focus on, on this. But yeah, that augmentation, the curves are just like way smoother. Like they are just like the variations really were smaller. Um, we're going to come to your second question, if you remember. We're going to come to the next question. I mean, I just want to emphasize in case anybody got lost at the beginning. We're calling these pre-trained models, but that doesn't mean you just plop it in and it segments bone. It just, instead of plopping in a randomized model and training it, you plop in a pre-trained model. And what I tell people is you get the first 20 epochs for free because you jump right over that because in the first epoch it closes all that distance. So the pre-trained here means you get to, uh, not that you have to do away with training, but you get to do a lot less for higher performance. I, I know Hubert said that, I just want to drive that point home. Um, and then, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, does this pre trained model uh, work for pre trained for two class segmentation or are you working really good for, say, three, four yeah. classes? So that's exactly kind of bouncing out what, just, what Mike just said. The pre trained can be used with any classes. So they are just, they are not raw units, they are just units with weight already inside but you can just put as many classes as you want when you do your own training. Yeah, I think that's exactly what, what Mike was saying. It's like they, they, they're pre-trained, but they are not pre-trained on semantic segmentation. So you can just use them with any classes that you want, and then you will have your own model. I would, I'm gonna put this metaphor out if, if you guys disagree with me or if you wanna uh, challenge it, that's fine. Um, when we look at semantic segmentation models and we look at the UNET architecture, you can um, think of the first few layers of the model as learning the language and vocabulary of images and the last few layers as saying, now I know um, when I see these vocabulary words in combination, it's cortical, and when I see these, it's trabecular. And by, by vocabulary, I mean it turns out that images have edges and images have contrast sometimes, and they have noise sometimes, and they have soft edges and hard edges, and they have different texture patterns. And if you can imagine these as being separable lessons, I can learn the vocabulary uh, at a separate, I learn my ABCs and then I learn to read. Oh, I like that, I'm gonna go with that metaphor. Um, I can learn my ABCs and then I can learn to read. Well, in this case, we're teaching this model uh, to learn the ABCs of images and it's not learned, it's not training to segment. And so uh, we're training on uh, all these different scientific images, SEM, uh, TEM, micro CT, and it learns what is the vocabulary of images, and then you come and say, now I want you to, now that you know the vocabulary, you don't have to relearn that in the first 20 epochs, you already know that, now just figure out how to put those vocabulary words in combination to identify the cortical or the trabecular or the foreground from the background. Um, and uh, I have something else I want to say before the next question. Yeah, um, uh, we didn't give any credit in this talk, and that's because uh, I don't think anyone's ever told Hubert, I think Nicola and Benjamin are the only ones that know this. Um, 500K is, uh, is, uh, is a silly name for us, uh, but uh, I want to give credit to uh, Kadar Narayan. Um, Kadar has been doing a lot of uh, uh, good scientific imaging at, uh, at National Cancer Institute in Frederick, Maryland, and uh, I can't remember the first author, I don't remember if it was Kadar's student or postdoc, who showed back uh, in maybe April 2022, maybe it was April 2021, showed that they scraped the web for images of mitochondria. Sorry, for images of, of, SE, of SEM images of cells. So, you know, HeLa cells and Thora, whatever, all sorts of cells. And they scraped the web for SEM images from movies and stills at all different um, uh, magnifications they could find, and it, so different pixel sizes and different uh, beam energies. And they, they took all these data that they scraped and they pre-trained a model 
And then they were able to uh, show that then you could train models more quickly. So, uh, and they were also doing something like this to, to automatically segment mitochondria in the end or automatically box out mitochondria. So when, whenever we think of that paper, uh, and because they had 500,000 images that they scraped in their initial model, uh, they called their model something something 500K, CMOS, no, uh, uh, 3DEM, I can't remember the name of their model, but ended in 500K. And so we said, can, can, we, can we follow, you know, can we stand on their shoulders and, and do work like that? And what, what's it called? CEM. CEM uh, 500K. And so we used our library of images of industrial part CT and bone CT and uh, nano CT and synchrotron CT and TEM and SEM and created a big library and then, uh, uh, and then use that to pre-train. And now you can use that whether you're looking for to segment mitochondria or bones or whatever, it's, it's the generic model. But we, we just happened to call it 500K because we didn't have another vocabulary for describing the uh, large heterogeneous library training. But I just wanted to give a, a credit to Kadar because I don't think we, we show him or his, uh, we should really look up his first author and, and uh, give credit to them as well. Uh, other questions? Um, I'm going to go over here. Yep. Yeah, so nice. It looks really fantastic. Is there any risk in applying one of these pre trained models that's been pre trained on bone on something that's not bone? And the second question would you change the training protocol if you were working on a pre trained model versus an untrained model? Would you change the learning rate or anything like that? Yeah. So there's two questions. The first question is. Um, is there like a drawback to using uh, the bone uh, pre-trained for something else? Well, I don't know. I didn't try. Uh, I will expect I will expect that there is because it was pre-trained on bone, but I actually don't know the answer. But that's why you know, for the if you want to apply to something else, use the AORS generic one because this one doesn't preclude or include any like it's just anything. So I would say you just go with the more generic if you want to use the bone because it's more. Uh, it's not even out there anyway. So we're just like testing at the moment. So that would be the first question. Then the second question was, uh, what was the second question? Do you question? change the training parameters? Ah, yeah, do you change the, yeah. So as far as I'm concerned, the, the training uh, is was in this experiment was exactly the same for untrained and pre-trained. Uh, whether it will change or like it will give better results for pre-trained, I don't know. Uh, maybe that's an experiment to, to be done, but I will say just go with what you are using, just get a, a pre-train and, and see and see what's up. Other questions? I think, there, Doug, you have another question? And, and then after that, we'll, we're gonna get through all these questions, we got time. So we'll go to Doug and then we'll go to Josh and we'll go to whoever's behind Josh, uh, Connor. So we'll start so with Doug. It's about the scaling. So for the Bones 500K, what scaling did you use? And in particular, did you use Hounsfeld units? Because with Bone, clinical scanners or big clinical scanners in vivo, a lot of the data's gonna be I'm jumping in front of Hubert to explain something I, I, I don't think anyone's ever told him. Um, the, if I define Hounsfield units, this is, a, this is an, an interface deficiency. This is a, a, a problem with the software. If I define Hounsfield units and I train a model and then I, I give the model to you and you define your own Hounsfield units, even if they're defined under the exact same name, uh, they're not compatible. Uh, they're, they're both unique and separate. I would need to pass you my Hounsfield unit calibration. And my Hounds, they could both be called Hounsfield units, but inside the Dragonfly software, there'll be this long, unique identifier afterwards. And then that's how they would be differentiated. Um, but uh, uh, you, uh, now I'll let you answer the question. Did you, do, do you need to get in right now or? Well, I was gonna say with that particular one, if your data is already CT scaled, it's calibrated. Yep. Yeah, let me, let me say what Luke said, but into the microphone. If, if you're working on a system that already calibrates, so the calibration is because a lot of systems and a lot of users don't have a calibration protocol, and it's just between zero and 65,000 counts. If you're working with a CT system that has a solution, whether it's phantom-based or some other method-based, that spits it out in units that have meaning, and every scan you do comes out in units that have meaning, 
Um, is, the, is that the case of the Perkin Elmer scanner that you're using? Do they come out in Hounsfield units? If they come out and, uh, and all of your scans, if you look at the histograms, they're pretty much the same, then um, you can just uh, forget, forget to use calibrated at all because your data is pre-calibrated, I believe is, is Luke's point. So, where the if lies for the right, so if if you were going to do all this work on your own and you didn't have ours, then you would just use your Hounsfield units. If you said, "Oh, Hubert has the model, and I want to use Hubert's model," then you need to put yours on our units, and so you can calibrate, and then you could always uncalibrate later. But you you would calibrate, and so now you do need to know the answer. What scale did he use? Did he use? But just for you to reproduce it, it wouldn't, yeah. Uh, do you know the name of the scale you used? You just called it, he just called it bone and he had zero and 100. But the behavior is going to be the same uh, uh, in his protocol. It's just before we ship this model, we need to uh, document what calibration scale it's, it's uh, done against and make sure we ship that calibration scale with Dragonfly so users can uh, take yeah, advantage well, of it. Um, um, if, if I may add, the, the calibration follow the models and the channels that are calibrated. So if you import them. Ah, so it turns out that if you, if you get a model from someone, like uh, you train a model or share a model, when you load that model into Dragonfly, it says, oh, I see this model was trained against some calibration model I've never heard of. This, this deep learning model was trained against some calibration scale I've never heard of, but it's encoded in the file and I'm adding it into your library. So uh, you could, if you start loading a bunch of deep learning models from a bunch of other people, you may see your list of available calibration scales grow if they're coming with calibration scales. So it's, it's embedded and encoded uh, in the model, I believe is what Benjamin is telling us. The bone model is calibrated, but the ORS 500K is not. Yes. So no need for calibration, a, a posteriori calibration when you assign classes. Okay, so ORS 500K, which is available now, does not expect your data to be calibrated. It's, it's got such a wide diversity of data, all these grayscales, that it's doing what it does. Uh, Luke, you want to get something in before the next sure, question? There is one pre-trained model that is calibrated. It's the additive manufacturer Yeah, so let me, let me paint a picture of, Hubert just talked about these 500K models, and so there's uh, ORS 500K, which exists as an ORS 500K unit, ORS 500K three slice unit, and there are different architectures that are all trained on the same. And then we shipped all of those already, and then, and those are all uncalibrated, if I'm gonna be perfectly clear. And we also took one model that's designed to detect uh, porosity and foreground image matrix. So pores in, in this case, the, in additive manufacturing, but it probably also works on pores in castings. And that uh, was trained on data that was calibrated on a zero to 100 scale that you can use in Dragonfly called the century scale. So if you load a data set and you calibrate on the century scale, then you can use the additive model. So what we ship in Dragonfly today is a bunch of 500K models that you can use, and we also ship the additive uh, porosity detection model. The additive porosity detection model, is it a pre-trained model like you're supposed to train with it? No. no. Or it, yeah, it, it, it is a semantic segmentation model you can use out of the box. So these are, these are pre-trained models that you can use to train for whatever purpose. And then this is probably what you thought we meant the first time we said pre-trained model. This is the model that it actually is pre-trained for one specific task, which is the binary segmentation of pores in additive parts or other industrial parts. And this requires calibration, and these currently do not require calibration. We would like to get to a place where Dragonfly can be a clearinghouse for sharing your, your trained neural network models. So yesterday, Jess was showing us, uh, uh, showing us segmentation of 11 different classes in cryotomog cryotomograms of neuronal cones. And when that's published, we'd like her to share that model. And it would be, you'd, you could choose the additive model, you could choose the cryo, cryo EM model. And of course, you could just make a copy of it and then add more training to, to uh, cross train it and do transfer training for your purposes. Um, in addition, we also saw uh, yesterday uh, from, uh, from Aaron Bigelow, we saw that uh, they've got this really great success in training these 
crazy thin cortical plates in cortical versus trabecular, um, you know, if, if they're willing after they've published their work, if they would share that model, then that would be available. We would very much love for people to be able to share their methods and make them reproducible among the rest of, uh, of the community. And so uh, that we, in, we used to use something called the infinite toolbox, but we think we have a, a, a slightly easier, more user-friendly way of, of disseminating trained models. Um, so uh, now, before we get to Natalie, we still have outstanding questions from Josh and Connor. Is it, she has to go to get the plane. Oh, let's ask Natalie before she runs out to catch uh, her plane. Just a comment. I wanted to, to explain uh, Mike's dominance here because uh, the uh, Universal Soldier was uh, planted into my head in 2020 when we were staffing the booth in uh, uh, Phoenix. Uh, ASBMR. <laughs> I, I I'll say this in in 2020 during COVID, you know, be careful what you say on tape. Um, in in 2020, I uh, I said, uh, you know, I think I said something like, uh, you know, engineers are are terrible at predicting. They if you ask them how much they can get done in a year, they'll over predict. If you ask them how much they can get done in 10 years, they'll under predict. Um, uh, because it's, it's hard to gauge how much technology is going to change. And I said, but here's, here's my prediction. I said, um, within two years, someone will have a, a universal labeler of mitochondria, and someone within two years, someone will have a universal labeler of bone. Well, I, I'm one out of two. No one went and did the bone work, uh, except Natalie went and got the funding, and now, now we're on track. Uh, but someone did do the mitochondria work. I was proved right on that one. Um, and, uh, you know, we, you know, the idea that we're doing and training these models and you have to train a model for your composites, you know, your model for your, uh, your battery and whatnot, uh, you know, 10 years out, it's going to look completely different. No one's going to be training models like this. There is going to be, you're going to tell it, you know, five seconds worth of information and it's going to go, oh, I know what you want. And then it's going to segment. So, uh, the landscape is going to change rapidly. Um, but, uh, but yeah, this is, this is how we get there. Uh, so thank you, Natalie. Uh, safe travels back to Montreal. Um, say hello to King Tut and to Andrew Nelson. Um, uh, so let's go to uh, Josh and, and then uh, and then Connor, I think. Fair enough. Well, uh, uh, yeah, what you were saying is uh, close to what I was going to ask about. Uh, so when you had the drop downs of the different algorithms and then you chose the, the dragonfly one right in the video that you're showing and then from that had a drop down of even more options, um, I was wondering what kind of reference documentation dragonfly supplies on what these different models are, why to choose one over the other, because um, you're saying you know you might incorporate Jess's and that would be a, a cryotom model, but then do you write in like a PDF some sort of reference documentation that you supply along with it? Do you want this or me? No, okay. Um, no one knows the answer to which model should I choose first. Right. Uh, so if I if I told you that was in the documentation, I would be making something up. I, you shouldn't believe me. Um, we, we've done some uh, some experiments, but the field doesn't know. The field is still innovating new models, and no one knows uh, ab initio, or no one knows uh, uh, yeah, no one knows before if this model is going to outperform this model. Although I can say that 95% of the time I reach for a three slice unit, and I'm satisfied without having to change and, and go experiment with something else. Um, we could talk about that during the, the best methods. Now, these different model architectures, they're all, they're all um, in fact, we have done very, very, very little um, innovative deep learning research. What we've been doing is we've been creating a software experience and doing software engineering to make the existing research accessible to non-experts. So we did, obviously didn't invent UNET, we didn't invent Sensor 3D, and so there are all these different architectures in the software, and I don't think any of them is a novel design by our team. We can read the literature and read a description of a, of a model architecture in a paper, and then three hours later we can have it in the software. The, uh, all of the models uh, that are available in the documentation, it does tell you the primary literature reference to that architecture, and, uh, but telling you which one to choose, can't do it because we don't know. You don't know. No one knows. Right, but um, something that says like, hey, this was built on cryotom data. 
Right, right. So, and in most cases, we're pretty respected, respecting the name that the authors gave it. Like, we don't, we, you know, we don't, we call it UNET, not magical segmentation button. Um, and sensor 3D is because it was called sensor 3D in the literature. Um, we don't have uh, Kadar's ORS 500K that was trained on, uh, 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 that was trained in Keras. We don't have his training data, so we, we don't have that model named. But um, you have to go to the airport too, right? Uh, do you want to? Uh, Okay. I just want to comment because the reason I chose sensor 3D is because I thought the documentation was great. And I looked through the papers, and it ends up sensor 3D was used in, in a very similar way to the, for the long data that I needed to use. And so that's why I kind of gravitated towards sensor 3D. So the comment is from is from Doug, and he's telling us uh, Doug, who gave the talk on the uh, the imaging that he's doing at UC Davis. He says he looked at the documentation when he was trying to figure out which model to use and sensor 3D. He read the papers that were referenced, and they were actually uh, directly relevant to his sort of imaging research. And so he he gravitated towards that model, deployed it, and so benefited from previous research and benefited from a clear documentation trail that that led him down the right path. Um, that was Josh's question. Now. Uh, Connor, do you have a question? Yeah, sure, thanks. Um, so I have a clarification question. Is S1 on this slide, the, is, is this made by you passing in one patch of training data and then using one different patch of validation data, or is it a different thing that I'm understanding uh, incorrectly? So the question is, uh, for the S1, is so did I use, uh, uh, if I understood the question, like did I use one patch for training and then for the, va so the, the validation and the, tra and the training sets, they are different. They don't come from the same source. Right. That answers your question. And in this case, S1 would mean one big tile of 256 by 256. And then the validation would be another tile in another location. All right, so I was understanding correctly. Thank you. Yeah. We, should be, we should be very clear a um, uh, patch is a well-defined term in, in deep learning, and uh, if you ever use segmentation wizard in Dragonfly, we have a concept of a frame from which multiple patches can be extracted. And you can think of S01 as a single frame of 256 by 256. No one has asked the question, what patch size did he use? So how many patches were extracted from that? And no one's asked, uh, what did he use for validation? But uh, when you use segmentation wizard, the default is you provided a frame, and from that, it uh, randomly, almost randomly, grabs individual patches for validation or individual patches for uh, for uh, training. In these highly controlled experiments, where we want to make sure that we're subjecting everything to the exact same validation data, because what you see in S1, S4, and S16, if uh, if I if I know Benjamin uh, well enough, these are all using the exact same validation frame, even though S1 has one frame of training, S4 probably has that frame plus three more, and S16 has those four plus 12 more, but they're all being benchmarked against the same validation and the same evaluation data to be systematic. Otherwise, you could just get lucky in your S4 and they could all look really good because that data just happened to be easier to segment. No, we're, we're using the same benchmarks on all three. There's no randomization in the, in the selection of validation or evaluation data. Uh, and if you wanted to, you could do that in, in, in your own Dragonfly experiments, but we don't make you go to the trouble of declaring this is validation, this is evaluation. We just let you uh, randomly select those. So I think I've been clear about what patch is, and I think it's clear what S1 is. It's a 256 by 256 frame yeah. from which multiple patches are. How, do you know your patch size in these yeah, experiments? 126. One, uh, 128. 128 uh, patch. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, I have a question about your um, comparisons for um, the development kit and the untrained. Um, so, your, like in your box plots, your scales were always very different. Um, yeah. Sometimes it was only like a very small difference, like 99.5 versus 99.7. Um, so, like, so I guess that statistically it's different, but does it actually, that small difference, does that really significant in terms of real world like performance, like in terms of, like, does it make your segmentation that much better and your analysis results better? Or have you tried actually going further and, and seeing the effect of that minor difference on your? Yeah, so, yeah, so the, um, what well, we see here, for example, 
you get 0 uh, 0.92, and then you get 0 0.99, for example. So that, that, that's a big gap from untrained to ORS, right? Uh, like, if the dice is better, the segmentation will be better. Like, point. Like, the images, maybe it will be a few pixels from there to there, but you will just get a better, uh, you will get a better uh, model. But you, your question was about the bones and the ORS? No. Uh, no like, like Zimbra, like yeah? Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, is it, is that, will that so it's, yeah, yeah. So that would mean like to check at the image and to see like where like this, the difference will be located. Like I didn't check that, but I can definitely go and check the images. But again, if the dice is better, your segmentation will be better. Whether by one pixel or two pixel in this small gain that you get from the bones, uh, it would still be better. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's a very good question. And I think uh, if you wanted to go to the next step, you could say, all right, I care about trabecular spacing. I care about cortical thickness. I care about periosteal uh, a perimeter. You could pick a measurement you, you care about as your benchmark and then see a dice score of 90 model gets me this value. A dice score of uh, 99 gets me this value. Oh, wait, they're exactly the same. Then there's no difference for the quantitative metric I care about. It's going to depend on the benchmark sample. And we don't have one benchmark sample, so we can use this as an objective function. But it could be that all the benchmarks we say there's no difference here. We, we don't know until we do that test. Um, but uh, I think maybe the takeaway from the slide we're looking at right now is that in the case of limited training data, the difference is drastic. And in the case of abundant training data, the difference is diminished. So if you're in a case where somebody dumps 100 megapixels of training data on you, maybe don't worry about the pre-trained model at all. Has that ever happened? <laughs> Has anyone been had 100, 100 megapixels of training data dumped on them? In the case where you're starting from scratch and you want to, especially when you're bootstrapping your way in, you can start with one tile and you know you get a, you're probably going to get a detectable difference um, uh, in in the very beginning. And so, uh, yeah, I, I would I would draw that uh, takeaway from this slide. I think I think what you say is right, and but what you say depends on deciding on a benchmark and maybe of the 50 people in this room that care about bone or the 30 people in this room that care about bone, they might, they might suggest a benchmark that uh, Natalie and Hubert might try uh, that, would be, that would drive, away that, drive home that point. Because um, it could be at the end of the day, oh, you know, 0.7 models and higher, it's not gonna be that, that good. Uh, but maybe 0.92 you know, models and higher all give the same trabecular thickness. So you know, maybe it's inconsequential. It's a good, really good question. And more questions. Yeah. All right, Theo. Yeah. Well, I was just thinking, good time. sometimes you don't have the ability to train for 250 epics. You want to see some results fast. And to Herbert's point, the pre-trained models just converge so much faster. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy. The, I mean, look at it. Like, just if you, if you were to check, like, you know, when the model reached 0 0.8, just, just, you know, if you will just, I, I wanted to do that, actually, to draw the line and see how many epoch and actually how many times it will take. It's just, it's just so much faster. For the point is that it, there is no, there's no, as far as I know and as far as we know, there is no drawback. Like you know, like there is no, there is no penalty of using that. It's there. You know what I mean? So that's really something that blows my mind. It's just, it's just really good. You get 20 epochs for the price of one. Even more. <laughs> Even more. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's thank you there again.